I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, home to the one and only Story Cycle system. Do you want people to actually give a crap about you and your purpose-driven company? Then our proven system will help you tell them a better friggin' story. And that's the secret sauce, folks. You gotta have a better, clear story. You can get started right now by downloading your 64-page DIY brand story strategy workbook at businessofstory.com. It's filled with examples, links to tutorial videos, and will help you clarify your story to grow your revenue and amplify your impact. And if you're really proud of how your brand story comes together, let me know. We might put you on our show to share your new narrative with the world. So download your Story Cycle Guide right now as you listen to today's show. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Hey, welcome back to Business of Story. I'm Park Howell. I'm so glad you're here because I've got a good friend on the show today and a gentleman that became a good friend after doing a fairly rigorous brand story development with him and their incredible firm, Blue River Interactive in Sacramento, California. Uh, Sean Schroeder's with us. And Sean, welcome, by the way. We're jumping right into this. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Park. Great to be here. This is going to be fun because I got to tell you, this was a task. We uh, had to roll our sleeves up and really figure out and dig deep into this company to understand its brand story because they do a number of things. They do them very, very well. But the challenge when you do a number of things very, very well, you get spread a little bit thin across the board as to who are you and what do you stand for. So Sean showed up. And how long had you guys been working on your brand story before, well, before you and I jumped in in June. Oh man! Well, we've been working on our brand story for I don't know a decade. I don't know. It's been it's been a while. We took another stab at it starting last fall and uh, began with trying to kick off a new website redesign. And our designer threw his hands up and kind of didn't really know what to do and uh, raised a huge red flag for us. And we're like, all right, well, I guess we've reached that point at which. We have to get real with uh, how we talk about our business and um, how we communicate that to our employees. And so um, it, 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 did, it started there, and it took us a while to, to get with you, but it was a process. And fortunately, uh, you know, we landed at a good spot. I'm very excited about where we're going. Well, it'll be fun to share it with the listeners today. We are going to take you through the highs and the lows of creating the Blue River brand story using the story cycle system. And I must say, it started off first with the high for me because I'm always excited about bringing on a new client. And then I got the call that says, okay, Park, um, you know, we've been trying to do this now for a decade and we can't get there. And actually, we're not even sure you can get there either. So we might invoke our money back guarantee. And I had to do the big gulp. And I said, well, you're right. I do have a money back guarantee. Have never had to give any money back, but okay, you're on. And away we went. <laughs> well, well, to be fair, Park, it, was, it wasn't that I didn't have faith that you could do it because, uh, you know, being a, a big fan of your podcast and having listened to you for quite some time, I, I had faith. But the problem was I had business partners that weren't quite in the same headspace that I was in terms of, I was, they weren't that familiar with you. I hadn't been listening to you, you know, over the last year or so like I had. And so there is certainly some skepticism on their part. So that was my trying to play the money back guarantee card for them so that I could hook them in so that I could work with you. <laughs> well, and I appreciate that too, because it did put more stress. I mean, more clarity for me. It was great. I actually like being called out on it because I'm like, <laughs> okay, let's get after this. And then you were kind enough. We had to move pretty quickly 
we were in June of this summer, and I was leaving for Europe working with ASU in my course there, and I was going to be gone for a couple of weeks, and you had some family vacation things going on, but timing was kind of of the essence to get this thing going. So after we agreed that, yep, let's work together, let's get this thing dialed in, you sent me a, a ream of information that I was calling through, and and I was even having a very hard time finding the story thread in that. But then you took the time to come down to Phoenix, and we spent a day together. We did. We did. And, you know, going through the story cycle worksheet uh, was helpful for us. I mean, it illuminated a lot of holes, I guess, in our story. And I realized there were some things that I, I didn't know about our business as well as I should know. But I think that ultimately all traces itself back to uh, the lack of having you know, a good story to tell. Yeah, I think you're right. Once you really get your story clarified, it just allows you to get way more focused on what you do really, really well. And I've actually found in my own life, it, it simplifies your life. Because once you get that crystal clear focus going, that you get to shred a lot of other things or just get rid of them and not focus on those things that maybe were taking up your time before, but now you can get a laser-like focus with Yeah, them. absolutely. There was a, I had a ton of anxiety about um, how we talked about our brand, how we talked about our software, how how we talked about our professional services. And, you know, even though there was a common thread there that you uncovered, you, you know, for the you know, longest time, I really felt like we're sort of lost in the wilderness and weren't quite sure which direction to go. And uh, after settling on the brand story that you helped us with, you know, it really, it really has made everything so much easier. I mean, I, I say I sleep a lot better at night. <laughs> well, let's give our listeners a little bit of a background on Blue River, who you guys are, how you came about, a little bit about the Mirror platform, and for everybody listening in, understanding that they do really great work as so many companies and their competitors do across the country in the digital space. And so the real trick is to find that differentiator. What do they do differently? and better than anybody else. But let's give them the big picture of uh, who you were before we sat down and started working through your story. Wow, who we were. So we were a software company. We created the Mural platform, which is an open source uh, and with a commercial um, offering content management platform, uh, as well as essentially a digital agency. And we started as a digital agency and Mira itself came out of our work as that. So it's been very very much driven by our customers over the years, uh, in addition to um, kind of solving our own pain points as an agency. Yeah, and so you built this f on your behalf to help. And, and you are the guy that's in charge of a lot of the content that comes out of Blue River and on behalf of your clients. So this was kind of your way and some of your partner's ways of making your life easier inside. And, and did you build it first for yourself and not really thinking about commercializing it? Or how did that Yeah, for sure. It was done purely out of selfish reasons. When we were just getting started, this is way back in 2001. We were a very small local, you know, web development agency. And, you know, we would end up with customers that you know, during that time, you know, content management wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. Uh, most of the opportunities that people had for content management software were mostly enterprise plays, very expensive, and certainly most small businesses, you know, or even smaller local governments and uh, nonprofits would even have access to it necessarily. So as a result of that, they would often send us requests, hey, can you input this content? Can you update our website? Can you do all these things? A lot of stuff that I've been doing for, for several years that was just, you know, just really mundane and painful and boring and just really sucked the life right out of me. So it was really a reaction to not wanting to do that kind of work. Uh, you know, wanted to spend my time creating things and building building things that helped make my job easier, but also as part of that, as a result, helping our customers uh, make their lives easier as well. Yeah. So you've got this two-headed, uh, very handsome animal, I might add. Uh, you've got the digital agency and you've got the software company. So you have these two worlds that are working together, but kind of also at odds when it comes down to really focusing what your story is. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I don't know that you can count a, a digital agency or find one that would have credibility as a software company. Likewise, you're not going to find a software company that has a lot of credibility at doing agency quality work. Um, and that's kind of where we're unique in that regard. And we really uh, focus on trying to do both things very well. So then you, we decided we we're going to work together. You came down to Phoenix on a very, very hot 
Friday afternoon in June, as I recall, and you and I sat down in my conference room here, and we got together, you know, got acquainted in person, but then we started peeling back the onion, if you will, of all the different things you guys did and what you stood for as a company and the products and services that you provide, and that's when it really almost got more confusing, maybe for both of us, before it got clear. I, I was, it was already confusing to me, so I was just sharing my confusion with you. <laughs> and and you did a beautiful job of totally confusing me because at the end of that very long day, we drove around, went over and looked at a Frank Lloyd Wright home, tried to look over the, the, the fence there so to show you some of the amazing architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And I bring that up because then you took off, went to see your dad, and I went to my family, and then we didn't talk again or see each other again for quite some time. And it just seemed sort of surreal because you and I had – gotten acquainted and started trying to figure out the story. And that was the first time when I was driving home, I'm thinking, I'm not sure I can help these guys because I couldn't find that clear thread yet in that first conversation, even after you had already yeah, and if you recall, the story cycle system. You know, during our meeting, I asked you, have you ever failed at this? <laughs> and I and with stiff upper lip, I said, hell no, of course not. No, I, the failure is exactly. not an option. Well, you did you did share that you had one customer that that they but, didn't uh, initially adopt your your brand story suggestion and then changed their mind two days later and became wildly successful. So well, yeah, and and in fact, they fired us when we did their fight. We got to the point of what they wanted their story to be, and it would have worked for them, except unfortunately, their competition had already uh, taken it over and owned it in the marketplace. And we explained to them, you can't have that story because you're primary competitor already owns that story. And they say, well, that's our story. And they stole it from us. And I go, all right, well, that may well be, but they're doing a hell of a lot better job telling it than you are. Therefore, they own it and you cannot. And they said, of course, you don't understand us or our industry. You're fired. We said, all right, thanks. And then a day later, they came back and said, yeah, okay, you're right. What do we do now? And we were able to find a different brand differentiator for them that really, really worked. But that's the part of this, the, the process. And then all of you that have tried to do your brand story development, it's okay if you get in the weeds and you get way more confused before the clarity sets in. It's all a part of the process. And I think all you got to do is kind of stick with it. So we went through this and we really started invoking then the story cycle system, the 10 step process and went through this. And when um, do you feel like it started coming together for you, Sean? When you say it, what are you referring to? You're talking about the, the brand story or my understanding of our story? Yeah, the understanding of your story. Once you just started getting more clear where this thing was going. I don't think I had any clarity until you came back and, and said, hey, here's here's the big idea. What do you think? And, you know, here's here's why I think this makes a lot of sense for you and and – shared some of the backstory for it and how it really ah, okay. communicated and aligned with everything we do. Yeah. And this was a solid two months after we initially met and we were digging through everything. So let's just jump right into it. Um, Sean, you want to take them through what your experience was, you know, when we did have that conversation and where it's led to, and I'll just jump in and out of the conversation as we go. So you take the story from here. Okay. Well, so you came back to us, we gave you, I gave you that whole big brain dump of all of the things that we do and think about. And you came back to us with this idea of flow, which I was not familiar with. You explained it as, uh, this, this study of, I guess the ultimate, how would you explain that? The culmination of 30 years of study by Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who was a, was a professor at Claremont College down in Southern California. And this idea of flow was something that he came up with after trying to look for the source of human happiness. And uh, when you explained to us what it was and the background for it, it instantly resonated with me because I think that's something that I've been Personally, I'm always looking for ways to create flow in my life. I just didn't know that it was a word. And I certainly didn't know that I was trying to do that in my work. Well, think about it, too. Um, once it all started really coming together, the Mirror platform was designed for you internally to find flow in your work, to get rid of the needless, senseless minutia so that you could focus on the bigger ideas and make that stuff just almost second nature that you didn't have to think about it, that it would not be interrupting your own work process. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the I guess the interesting or ironic meta moment of it is that I actually experienced flow while creating Mira 
as I was trying to create flow for myself and our customers. Yeah. And uh, when that happens, oftentimes the best brand story DNA, the, the, the thread of your story comes literally from you and the DNA of the company. And this is where we were looking at a lot of different ways to bring this two worlds together, the digital agency and the software company. And why do you exist? What is it that you do different than anybody else? And so we always start in step one of the brand position or the position statement. And your statement re reads now, Blue Interactive is the number one resource for the most free flowing content management experience and functional design services for medium to large business to business organizations. So we want to define you, make you different in that you're not just another digital firm, you're not just another software company. You bring those two worlds for one together for one primary reason, and that is to create flow in the lives of your customers and the lives of your employees, and even in the lives of folks like me that are working with your customers, looking in um, for the the actual users of the equip or uh, uh, of the platform. So it's about finding that continuous uh, theme through all audiences that really ties back to what you are all about from the very beginning. And that is to find flow in your own life and now helping your customers find it in other places. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So your unique value proposition as we go through the system and we start talking about, you know, who your audience is. At, well, let, let's, let's do that first. Who are your primary audiences that you're going after with your brand story? Our primary audiences, we have three of them. Two are related, and the other is kind of a, a strange bedfellow. Uh, we have uh, content managers and product managers who use the Mirror platform to publish content to their websites, intranets, uh, you know, whatever web property they have. We have B2B marketers who use the Mirror Experience platform to uh, deliver tailored content-driven experiences, uh, you know, web, uh, web content personalization. And then we also have developers who use the Mirror platform in order to extend the functionality, to integrate third-party applications, to do all the development of any uh, web properties um, that they may have. And what do all three of those audience, audiences have in common, or what do they have at stake that your product offering from a digital agency side and a software service um, side deliver for them or help them bridge? I would say it would just be reducing the... The amount of uh, what was the word you used? The di uh, digital uh, what was this? <laughs> detritus. Digital detritus. There was yeah. another one that you used as part of our our brand story. Was it the? Oh my goodness, I can't remember right now. Remember which word I'm talking oh, okay. about? Well, you actually have it in our document. Unfortunately, I don't have that up right now. Oh, okay. I'll have to go through it. Um, we'll we'll get back to that. In short, it's just kind of simplifying. Uh, and fulfilling the promise of technology. A lot of things that we try to accomplish, whether we're developers, content managers, or marketers, is we have to use software all day long and we have to use all these different tools. A lot of times, uh, you know, even though there's this promise that these tools are going to make our lives easier, uh, they don't and they complicate them. And so our goal, and we realize that we are one of those tools as well. And so our goal is to try and to, uh, you know, remove some of that, that angst of having to live in this digital life that we have to live in and, you know, use all these tools uh, together in order just to get our jobs done. Yeah, I think the term you're thinking about is is helping free them from the malaise of their digital environments. Yes, malaise. That was the word I was looking for. That's it, malaise, malaise. Yeah, it's it really is about that. And it was the one continuous theme that I heard from you spoken in a number of different ways, you know, making it easier getting this mess out of their hair so that they can focus on content and have easier analytics and all that sort of thing. So it kept coming back to this, but in the fog of war of trying to figure out this brand story, we weren't getting there as quickly as I normally like to get there. And that's what my confusion was. But then we had that aha moment. So you've got now your audience is understood who you're going after, you have your brand position, what you do different and better than anybody else, which then leads to that unique value proposition that brings that position together with your audiences. Would you like to reveal what your brand uh, value, your unique value proposition is? Um, I think you might have it in front of you, do you? Don't you? 
<laughs> oh, I do. That's right. You don't have your doc there, do you? Okay, it is. That's all right. <laughs> Blue I Blue River Interactive creates peak customer experiences by freeing your natural content flow. Now, it to me made so much sense when we got down to this. So Blue River Interactive, the brand creates peak customer experiences. That's what you're ultimately about. And you talked about the experience of the Mira um, platform and how people loved it and it was easy to use. So it, really leveling them up, getting that peak experience. And then this idea of freeing your natural content flow. So you are not buried in this malaise of what you got to be doing with typical content management systems. So it frees you to be thinking about the kinds of content and how to really interact with your customers on a very human level. And hopefully then that tool, that product enables you like you're a, a great performer or uh, an athlete where you're just finding that peak experience, that zone and creating that content. That is the goal. <laughs> that is the goal. Now, I got to ask you, tell and for all of you listeners out there, if you take just a second and think about that time when you have experienced flow. And by that, again, like Sean said, it's when everything seems effortless, you lose track of time. Um, you're just, you know, at the top of your game and you just feel like you're totally in flow with the universe. Things are just coming together. Now, this could be something uh, from a sports uh, activity you're doing. Music, Sean and his partners are all very, very good musicians. And I'm sure, Sean, you have felt the flow when you're on stage when everything is just clicking along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I find it in many, many different places, you know, from writing to playing music to producing music. Um, to writing code. Uh, and that's the, the cool thing about it is that uh, and one of the reasons that it really resonated with me is you can find flow in many things. It's kind of one of the unique uh, things about the human experience is that you, whether it's, you know, creating a, you know, building a brick wall or, you know, I was remodeling a bathroom several years ago and laying tile and we did the subway tile in the bathroom. We did a lot of it and it took a long time to do, but I was explaining to my wife, I was like, hey, that, I actually kind of enjoyed that that process because I didn't know this at the time, but I was experiencing flow. I was just, you know, putting the mastic on the tile, putting it on the wall, getting it all perfect and everything. And there was something really uh, gratifying about doing that. Yeah. And yet so often in business, we don't think about bringing it into the business world because we just get so focused on what we got to do and get, get it out. And, you know, we bite our nails and we eat too much and then we drink too much at night <laughs> to try to get us through all that. But if we could go into work, in a very mindful way and find flow in what we do, how we approach our work and in the tools such as the mirror platform um, that helps us get there. To me, that seems like a very aspirational way for a brand to go, especially someone that, you know, an industry you don't necessarily think flow in, in the digital world and the IT world and the content marketing world. Well, no. And especially with, you know, the, you know, the malaise that we all experience on a daily basis and using all these different tools. Yeah. Yeah. It can really be overwhelming. Now, um, in the digital realm, we know that game design is really based on flow because they are always trying to trigger flow within their audiences, within their players, because when you do get that going in your players, then you are getting them, you know, you're, you're exciting all those neuro uh, transmitters and you make that game addictive to them, that they can't put it down, that they got to keep returning to it. So that certainly has proved itself out in the gaming world, and yet not many people in the digital content marketing development world have really tapped into that. So you guys are one of the first ones to do that, that, that I could tell anyway. Yeah, well, thanks to you, Park, you helped us find our flow, you know, within our brand story. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting. That was, I think one of the things that really helped make it real for us was seeing a real example where people were already using these concept of the concept of flow and the principles associated with it in order to create digital experiences that people became really immersed in. And that's obviously with digital gaming and almost every, every game today uses these principles of flow in order to create games and make them something that people want to play for hours and hours and hours at a time. And so now you're doing that with your brand story. We get into the brand promise part of your story, and your brand promise comes down to one word. And we always look to do that. If you're out there trying to do your own brand story, folks, um, think about one word that would describe uh, the emotion or what would trigger an emotion that you would want to have happen around your brand. And it's whether the, it's in every brand touch point, whether 
they're calling in, whether they're hitting your website or they're using your product. And Blue River's brand promise that plays off of the flow is simply the word freedom, giving you the freedom to do your best work. How's that playing out now within your company? And I know you guys are just starting to enact that internally, but how does that brand promise play into what you do and how you're approaching business? To be honest, it's it's filtering through every single aspect of our business, you know, and pitching my business partners on the idea of adopting this as our brand story. Uh, I did a fair amount of research and, you know, really looked at ways that we can infuse this into every single thing that we do. And it does. Um, it we I, You know, I took their eight principles of flow that uh, Cheek sent me. I identified that not all of them have to be present, but some of them do. Um, and some of them are present when people find them selves experiencing flow. And so I create a subset of those down these five, five principles and looked how we might apply them both or not both, but across our business to not just our customers, but to how we design applications, including Mira. Uh, we often do custom development projects for some of our larger clients. And uh, so we do that within our software, within the software that we build, um, look at how we can create flow within our employees' lives. What does that mean uh, for us culturally? Uh, and there was a really interesting thing that I found in my research. Um, was, uh, was it Cynthia Maxwell, I believe is her name. From She's the director of IT at Slack's at Slack, actually uses flow in order to measure job performance. And so I did some more research on that and how we might use these five principles of flow in order to help create flow for our employees and help create more meaning in their work at Blue River. And what were the five principles now that you were basing, you know, your brand story helped inspire, but you're now basing operational excellence off of? So those five um, would be clear goals, uh, meaning everything you do, um, you know exactly where you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be going, providing clear and timely feedback. So as you're trying to accomplish these goals, you're getting feedback that you are either going in the right direction or the wrong direction, or you may need to adjust. Making sure that there's a balance between uh, the challenge and the skill level. When the challenge gets too high, it creates a lot of anxiety uh, for people, and they tend to uh, not complete the task um, as often and tend to check out. Uh, same thing goes where if it's not challenging enough, we find that people become really bored and they also check out at that point. So what we try to do is create that, that sweet spot in between by creating that balance between the challenge and the skill. Uh, and then other things like eliminating distraction and reduce, reducing worry of failure. And how do these play into then as you're actually designing and perfecting and iterating on the Mira platform? Uh, well, it, you know, it's interesting. It does have some applications uh, within, say, from a UX perspective. Uh, so when we look at creating the the interface for the Mira platform, uh, you know, someone ultimately they're going in to accomplish a task, to create to create content, uh, to get it published, to um, you know, do something within the system that there's some particular outcome for. So making sure that when they do go to accomplish a task, that there are clear goals and that they know that they're getting feedback from the system along the way that what they're trying to do, they are actually accomplished so that it motivates them to keep going. Um, and of course, you know, balancing the challenge between the, or balance, having balance between the challenge and the skill is an interesting thing from a U.S. perspective because you don't, you, you know, you don't want to make any piece of software challenging, right? But we also don't want to make it so that there are too many steps in the way of you getting something done. So when we talk about it in that context of software development and UX, you know, there, you know, it sounds kind of weird to say, hey, we want to make it slightly challenged, but I don't really look at it as adding challenge so much as uh, adding, shortening up steps in order to accomplish something sooner. Um, and I think that helps, you know, create that balance there. Um, eliminating distractions. So when we're looking at, you know, the elements in the user interface, what things can we take away? How can we design things so that there's a specific hierarchy um, so that uh, it's not as distracting. So people can focus on the task at hand. And then, of course, reducing worry of failure, providing ways to recover when you do make a mistake. Uh, you know, having something as simple as a trash bin for your content, when you go delete it out of the system, it's still there. But we know that just because you delete it, you can, you can recover it. it. It's not gone forever. So simple things like that can be applied in, 
and you combine them all together and that's how we endeavor to create flow. And you know when you really get a solid brand story together is when it starts inspiring this kind of action and this kind of um, in, in interest, uh, introspection, if you will, of your operating procedures, of everything from the kinds of employees you want to hire to the type of environment and atmosphere that you want to provide to them so that they, you know, all these things work for them there. You've got clear goals for them, clear and timely feedback. You're balancing that challenge between the challenge and skill level so that they feel leveled up every day they're there. They're challenged. They know that they're doing good work. You're eliminating the distractions so they can find their flow throughout the day and um, taking away that fear of failure. Like, no, don't worry about it. If, in fact, if you're failing, means you're trying. So let's keep moving ahead. And who wouldn't want that kind of environment? And I believe anyways, when you have that kind of environment, then it's going to absolutely express itself through the products and services that you provide to your audience, your customers, so that your own brand story starts getting magnified, you know, amplified, not only within your own company, but then in the products and services you provide and how those services engage and interact with your clients and their customers. So it's like this self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you've got the right story that is true and authentic to what you're about, where where, where you started from from day one, um, that you, you really can't lose. It's a matter of just staying now focused and being very clear on that story as you uh, pull it together, as you craft it, as you tell it, inv- and invite other people into it. Yeah, I mean, and to me, that was the key to the whole thing. It was, you know, for something to have legs like that, it has to be authentic and true. Um, otherwise, you, you, you know, you have to feel like you're making stuff up in order to fill the promise that you, you know, that you're making. And that was our challenge before is that we didn't really know that that's what we we're trying to do. And therefore we're like, well, we're trying to make things easy. We're trying to create great customer experiences. We're trying to do these different things. And it's like, yeah, we, that's true. We are trying to do all those things. Um, however, we didn't have that North star that really allowed us to, you know, kind of take off the shackles of having too much to think about. Um, there's, you know, people have talked about in the past about how simplifying thing actually provides a lot of freedom. Um, and it's true. It does. I mean, having to not have to think about everything and really focus on the thing that we knew to be authentic and true, you know, provided us with our own flow. It granted us a ton of freedom in how we think about ourselves. And really, everything else just became so much easier. Yeah. Well, it did eventually because you said that, uh, you know, let's, let's tell the story about when you originally presented this to your partners and kind of the pushback you got on that. Because I think it's a really interesting look at all of us. Uh, when greeted with something new, we kind of like status quo. We don't get it immediately and then how it starts coming together. But, but flow wasn't immediately adopted by your gang. No, and I tried to prepare you for that part. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. My business partners are a very pragmatic group, and they have a very, uh, I guess, uh, their, their BS detectors are always on. And they have an aversion to marketing speak and marketing in general. So my challenge uh, was pretty big. And when you start throwing words around like storytelling and things like that, they you know kind of roll their eyes. They check out, and they're like, oh, whatever. You know, this is uh, just, can we just talk about things that are real? And so that was the big challenge. You know, when, when Park bought, you know, brought this to me, I thought Park did a great job of laying the groundwork for it. But I, even then I was like, man, I don't know if these guys are going to get it. And so I, uh, I had Park present it to them with me in the room. Uh, Mark, uh, Park was remote and, you know, Park couldn't see their re- reactions. Um, and couldn't hear their feedback and it was, uh, you know, it was it was tough. I mean, they were they were un- underwhelmed from the beginning, and they felt like even using the word "flow" was 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 too punny because it it just it it flowed too well with the blue Blue River the name, and and in that regard, it almost as a disservice because they didn't take it seriously. And so I had to go back and do a ton of research. And I was like, no, 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 I got this. This makes total sense to me. I understand exactly what Park is talking about here, and and so I went and. Listen, uh, read uh, or listen to the audiobook of Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. Listen to his book about flow, and the whole time that I was listening to it, I would go on a run, creating flow again by running and doing these things um, that help you know provide deep focus. And while I was listening to the book, he would talk about different things, and I, and I would have to stop and take notes because so many things that he was talking about, I could instantly see a way to apply them to our business. And so I went back, did a bunch of research, eventually came back with 
a slide deck of, I don't know, 109 slides that broke down the whole thing going back with all the way back to why I started the business, you know, our biz, or building the software part of our business way back in 2001 and everything that led up to, um, you know, why flow makes sense and all the different angles that we could take with it. Uh, bringing in Cynthia Maxwell from Slack and her perspective, um, uh, talking about, um, the game, you know, game design, and then looking at all the different ways that we could apply it in uh, UX and and uh, even for our developers that use the Mira platform. One of the things that we're always trying to do is create frameworks and and things for them to use to help them find flow. So if they're a a programmer and they're you know developing something in object or in JavaScript or Java or anything else, um, that we don't want to have them focus on having to deal with the UI of the tool. So we're always looking to provide frameworks, things to make their job easier. And once I went back and explained it all to them and showed them how it slotted into every single thing we did, uh, suddenly they were on board. Well, and you did something else that I think was really, really smart uh, from a guy who's trying to get you know a brand story into the group. And that is when you went and interviewed your employees and they, they had no idea what you were talking about. They had no idea about flow, but what do you, what was the question you asked them? Because that was the feedback that you gave your own partners and said, "Look, we're already doing this." Yeah, well, that was that was me, you know, being sort of white knuckling it about doing this presentation. <laughs> you know, I was worried. I was like, "Okay, even if I go through and show this great case for why this makes sense for our business, if our employees aren't on board, if they don't understand this, then my business partners aren't going to understand it, and they're going to shoot it down because they're say, like, no one's going to get this.'" So. Um, I actually, we use Slack in our business. And so I asked uh, most of our employees, I think all but maybe one or two, I asked them, have you ever experienced, um, you know, what people might call a state of flow or being in the zone? And if so, how would you describe it? And the results that I got back were, were crazy. Every single person. And I got to say, I did start out, um, you know, with some software. I picked the people that I knew would probably most likely Find it. We have a ton of crazy uh, creative people in our business. So I started with uh, people. There's a guy that does kinetic sculpture in our business. And I know, I knew if I asked him, he'd know exactly what I was talking about. And he came back and said, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that means. I, there are times when I don't eat for 10 to 12 hours because I am so immersed in what I'm doing with my art that I lose track of time. And, you know, everything just kind of goes by the wayside because I'm just so immersed in it. Uh, we have someone who has done stand up comedy before. Um, and also does painting. I asked him, same thing. He came back and, the, and it, with a great response to it. And he, you know, said, you know, talked about the different ways beyond those two things, how he's also experienced it. And that was the story with every single one. I was blown away by how it resonated with all our employees. And people would go from writing a paragraph to literally writing an essay about it completely unprompted. I just asked a simple question. And then I would follow up with, okay, so now that I understand that you know what this is, what are some things that you do to help get you into flow? So we wanted to look at what are the triggers that we can use because I'm going to use those as part of um, you know, recommendations for our employees and say, hey, these are all the things that you guys shared with me about how you get into the flow. So let's share all this information and let's help each other get into flow through our policies, through our HR uh, policies and through suggestions and just team sharing. It was really fascinating. And when you shared those stories with your partners, what were their take? Well, they, I mean, there wasn't really much for them to say at that point. Um, you know, they were, they were just kind of dumbfounded, like, wow, this is much bigger than they had anticipated. Like myself, I was surprised at how much bigger than it was. So, you know, it really helped them understand that what we were talking about was not just marketing speak. It wasn't just big fluffy ideas, but it had legs. It was true. It was authentic. And it was something that we could do starting tomorrow. Yeah, and I think you had one of your partners even say, well, why flow? Why not just say easy, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Yeah, so that, that was actually um, our UX director, and he, that was, he, he's always trying to simplify everything, which I appreciate. And so his way of doing that was saying, oh, well, you know, saying, why don't, why, instead of just saying flow, why not just say it's easy? And so I had to go through the thing and say, like, well, here, well, easy is not a brand platform. You know, easy is just a result of what we do. Um, and so we, I want to be very, very deliberate in how we approach this problem. And that's why flow matters. And that's why, you know, we're sort of hanging our hat on it because it does matter to us as a business. And it, it gives us a very deliberate way of implementing our brand story in a way that's very, very real. 
Well, and we had to move them, too, from thinking of flow as being a tongue-in-cheek thing that went along with the Blue River name. Exactly. Uh, and to know flow, flow is actually a thing. Flow is actually something that you can measure and something that is worth aspiring to because when we all find our flow, and we've all experienced in one way, shape, or form, but if we can find it in our business, in our you know, vendor, a la partner with uh, Blue River or help our clients and customers find it, then we're way ahead of the game. So the brand gift, while the brand promise is freedom, we're going to free you from the malaise of the digital environments or that digital detritus, which I still love that term. I, I got to get a T-shirt <laughs> with digital detritus on it, Sean. Um, uh, but to, to free you, the brand gift, and this is just answering the question, is your story is not about what you make, but what you make happen. So what is it that you make happen in your customer's life? And in this case with Blue River, the brand gift is helping you find your flow. Simply finding your flow, whether you are a partner, whether you are an employee, whether you are a client customer, or you're helping your clients and customers help their customers get it. It's all about the gift you bring to the party is finding your flow. So that becomes the big inspiration for what you do physically to help the world out there. Yeah. And you know what I love most about a park is that it through that the, the study of flow that Sheikh Semihai did, you, you know, he found that people, when you do find um, an activity that's meaningful like that, um, it, it, it goes beyond the work that you're doing. And not only does the activity become an end in itself, as he says, but it actually cascades that to other aspects of your life. So um, to me, uh, it was very, very profound in that I, I immediately found a way to start applying that to, you know, my life at home, how, you know, my kids watch TV, um, whether it's, you know, we look at it as a passive activity or an active activity. And there's an example that Csikszentmihalyi gives in his book um, about active versus passive, you know, TV viewing. Um, so um, there's that. There's applying these principles to flow. Um, I coach a lot of youth sports because I have kids and they play sports and uh, that's something we enjoy doing. But as a coach, I'm looking at how can I apply these things, you know, to uh, the athletes that I coach. And so it's it really is uh, I mean, it, it animates my life in so many different ways now. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about a, a really focused and authentic brand story is it reaches well beyond the office and, it, and well beyond the product and service. It does impact everybody that comes in contact with the brand, family, friends, foes, you name it. Um, a, a good brand story is going to do that for you. So we then move into, you know, as the in the enter the mentor stages, now it's like, how do you express this? What is the character? What is the consistent, authentic character look and feel that Blue River is going to go to market with? And it's probably what you already have, but it might be fine-tuned and focused even more. And you selected three brand archetype personalities, and we take you through this process where we look at 12 young in archetypes to start getting our heads around the personality of the brand. You selected one, the creator brand personality as your um, ultimate archetype, but it's also supported by the regular guy, gal, you know, what you see is what you get archetype. There's no BS when people come to see you. And also the sage, which I like too, because the sage is like, you know, we spent a lot of time working on this and we understand what you are going through because we built this platform initially for us. So we knew when it was working right and now have put it out to the world. You've given us your feedback and we keep iterating on it. So you've got the sage with the regular guy gal supporting this overall creator archetype. Now, I imagine you are in the throes of thinking about how are you going to redesign your website and work through your sales and marketing and your customer engagement from that creator mindset? Yeah, well, I mean, that's really at the heart of everything we do because we're constantly trying to solve problems. And I think that's one of the one of the part, the pieces or parts of the thread um, of our stories of business, because, you know, looking through our business, we have all kinds of creative people. And for the longest time, I was trying to figure out, like, what is that? What is that thread um, between developers, between project managers, between uh, designers? There's something going on here. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it for the longest time, but I've been thinking about it for years. Um, when we would go to developer conferences, we'd always, I'd end up meeting musicians. When I go to marketing conferences, I'd meet, you know, other musicians and people that do other creative endeavors. And I mean, it just it can't seem to get away from it. And so I think by virtue of the type of work that we do and that it is, it does, you know, at its heart does require that sort of elimination of distraction and high level of focus um, that you end up finding flow seekers. And I think that really is 
kind of the big thing. So uh, really highlighting uh, that aspect of our business that, you know, we really are um, creative, you know, by nature. And that's, that's why, that's why we started doing what mm-hmm. we did in the first place. And that's why Simon Sinek, and he talks about doing, you want to do business with people who believe what you believe. Um, this is similar to that in that, you know, we work with people who believe what we believe um, in that regard. And so that's, um, that's another way that it sort of gets articulated, that creative side of things. Yeah. And it comes out of this exercise that we did with you, too, where you're looking for the nine brand descriptors. This goes back to that one word that kind of describes or very much describes what the company's about. We end up with nine of them. And, Sean, we've just done this for so many years that for some reason nine seem to be the magical number that people would arrive at. And I can break it down into three buckets. So you've got a bucket about give me three descriptors that truly desire or, or, or describe the heart of the company. Then give me three descriptors that talk you know, to the heart of the product or service offering. And then give me three descriptors that talk about customer engagement. What does this all mean, You know, the make happen? And so your company descriptors came down to authentic, empathetic, and dedicated. So authentic, what you see is what you get you know, with us. Um, no BS, the regular guy-gal personality. But empathetic, that we've been to where you have been, customer and client. We know the malaise, the digital detritus that you have to deal with. And so we are trying to help you out of that and then dedicate it. That's what we do. That's why we show up every single day to help make your life easier to find flow. Then you moved into your product descriptors. And I love these because the product is determined. So it's kind of hard, like, how can a product be determined? Well, the people behind it certainly are, but you are constantly iterating and updating your product. And I've just seen in some of the chat groups online of the great reviews that you get from your users of talking about how dedicated you are to keep dialing it in and getting it better. It's empowering. So it it frees them again to do their flow. It empowers them to be better at what they do in content management, creation, developing, whatever. And it's meaningful. It's just not another tool that's floating across your desktop that you've got to deal with. It actually brings meaning. It's really meaning-filled and meaningful for your day and in your work. And then finally, that customer engagement about being mindful, inspiring, and harmonious. And I love this concept of mindfulness, of bringing mindfulness back to the desk and saying, look, we are not going to get in your way. We're not going to give you a platform that gets in your way. In fact, it's going to do the exact opposite. It's going to free you up so you can be mindful about your task at hand without the interruptions, which is inspiring and looking for that harmony throughout everything. So I thought the way those brand descriptors came together was great. The other thing I would point out to the listeners, when you're doing this, your brand descriptors, if you write them down, are typically, right out of the box, very operational, very jargony, and I guarantee you're going to have innovation in there. Everybody puts innovation in because everybody wants to think about being innovative. Well, I want you to dig deeper, um, as Sean and his team did, to find these kinds of brand descriptors that really get to the heart and the humanity of your brand, not just what you make, but what you make happen in people's lives. And that leads us to number nine, the moral of the story or the brand purpose. And I just love how this all comes together because this really becomes the North Star for Sean and his team. And it Brand purpose is this. Blue River Interactive helps people find their flow to simplify and enrich their lives. Now, who can't live into that? (laughs) So help people find their flow to simplify and enrich their lives. Everything from Sean and his family to his partners and their family to their employees and their family to their clients, customers, and their clients and customers. It's always about being focused on what you make happen in people's lives. Don't worry about the product or service. You are selling that, but you're selling it for a bigger reason, to, to help them find flow and simplify and enrich their lives. When you focus on delivering that to your clients, customers, and all your audiences, the money's going to find you, and it's going to find you in droves. So um, how is that sitting with everybody there so far, Sean? Uh, you know, I'm only partway through presenting it to our entire company. Uh, there are some key key people that are involved in things like content creation. Of course, my business partners, um, design, things like that where I, I can't not share it with them. But I haven't had a chance to go back and retool the deck that I did for my partners and retool that for employees because it really is um, a little bit of a different angle on our story. 
Uh, so, um, so far, so good though. Everyone that I've talked to and everyone that I've shared it with um, instantly gets it, and and it is it's great to watch them, you know, sort of emotionally embrace this idea. It's really, I mean, like I talk about how it's animated other as- aspects of my life, but it really is animated uh, the employees that I've shared it with in terms of how they view our business and and how they see themselves moving forward in our business. Yeah. Well, it's exciting. And now it, you, you've taken on this big challenge. We've gotten you to a story that I fully believe in because it is everything you talked about and that you do at Blue River. And it just is a terrific expression of that. What does your timeline look like? I know a lot of people are going to ask that. They're going to say, okay, great. Well, Sean's got a story. But now the real heavy lifting starts in expressing it and activating it throughout all of your materials, and your website, your Miracon conference coming up in the spring. What does your timing look like? And even a schedule, we won't hold you to it, but is this a six-month process, one-year process? What do you have on your plate to start really rolling this out? Well, we're, we've actually already started to let it uh, affect our content creation. So one of uh, another one of our great creative employees, a uh, great developer, is actually a science fiction writer, and he's he helps write our developer blog. Um, and so... Yeah, I've been sharing that with him, and he started. That's already starting to show up in some of his blog posts that he's writing for us, um, as well. I shared it with our de- design team. Um, as of the recording of this podcast, we have our. I guess this will be great for your listeners because if you happen to look at it when this airs, and we haven't launched our new website, so you'll be able to see sort of the state that we're in, which is not great in our opinion, um, and I always felt like there's a little bit of disconnect between our our BlueRiver.com site, which is our main company site, and then our product site, which is getmira.com, and our experience platform site, which is mxp.getmira.com. So you'll see these three properties, and you can kind of see the the disconnect between the three of them, because they're all kind of done at different times and with a different end goal in mind. But we're currently working on redoing all of those and consolidating um, a couple sites into one. Uh, and even when they're not consolidated, they're really going to reflect uh, that same theme of finding your flow um, throughout, uh, you know, all of our, our sites, um, when we redo them. Um, and it, you know, and it, it affects everything from our, you know, our content strategy to our tone, every single thing we do. Um, and then of course design, because it's, you know, if you're talking about uh, brand messaging, you know, design is another aspect of that brand messaging. And so it's going to show up there as well. Yeah. So when do you think it will be totally incorporated? Are you a year out, a year and a half out, or do you have a sense for that? I'm going to say should be completely rolled out by end of Q2 2018. Gotcha. Yeah. And it's a, it's an ambitious schedule because it takes a while. As you all know, it takes a while to do this sort of thing. But it's going to be really exciting to see how it all comes together because it just feels like it's hand in glove with what Blue River is all about, what you've always been about, and where you're taking your company. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right, Sean, any last words for our listeners when it comes down to doing this, the 10-step story cycle process to get you through this craziness of finding your story? I would say don't let yourself get overwhelmed when you start going through, you know, if you download Park's workbook, um, we had, you know, our story is a little bit complicated. It's probably easier for most people. Um, So, but if you are feeling overwhelmed, just trust the process uh, I'm a Dodgers fan, and one thing that Dave Roberts, the general manager, likes to say is you got to trust the process. <laughs> so I would say the same thing here. Trust the process and um, don't feel like you have to get it right. You don't have to get it perfect. and and Because that, that's kind of the point, right, is the, the fact that you're going through this process means that you don't have it perfect. So just accept that. Um, get it all out there, and um, hopefully you will find some clarity by doing that. Yeah, you're right. It's very much of an iterative process. You get into it, and those that do download the workbook and work through it, and then I work with them sometimes just on phone calls to get them through it, or you know, in your case, it's a much deeper engagement, that a lot of times I'll get a book that's half done, three quarters of the way done, because they just simply don't have the answers for everything. And that's all right. That's where I come in. I play part anthropologist, part psychologist. I think you even gave me the name Brandthropologist, maybe something like that. I liked it. I looked it up. Somebody's <laughs> already got that, so I can't have it. But, but it is. It's like, man, you got to dig through this stuff. You got to dig deep and think about it. And Sean did ask me one day when I came up with this and told him what you know what I thought about the flow concept. He goes, "Oh my God, you know what? Did this was this like a lightning strike that came out of nowhere, an epiphany?" And I had to be honest with him. I said, "Actually, it was sort of a 
duh. Well, I mean, I, it was sitting right in front of my face. It was like, there it was. There it is. There's what it, it's all about. And that's going to happen. You know, it's just that hard work showing up every day, filling it out, thinking it through. And then I think one of the most important parts about this is don't rush it. Let it sit around and sit in your head and rumble around, kind of like a crock pot. Leave it. Let it just perk and simmer and do all that stuff. Go away from it. Put it down and let it sit there for as long as it needs to so that you can can come back to it with a fresh mind. And you're going to see the spices then are starting to really take off. And all of a sudden, it sort of just materializes. And you go, ah, there it is. You got to get away from it before you can find it. <laughs> That's true. No, I think that is absolutely the case for us. You know, we go through the process of documenting all these things, then letting it letting it simmer for a while. Uh, not obviously, you were the one that came up with the idea, and um, I didn't even try to come up with that idea because I already gone down that path before. But you know, I, one of the things that I got most out of that simmering was realizing how you know that I guess documenting the truth within our business really, I guess, gave me that that sense of peace. Like, okay, well. If we go through this process and it's all true and it's all authentic, then at least we'll come up with something that we don't have to make up. And hopefully it will grow legs of its own from there. And it most certainly did in our case. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get you back on the show in a few months after you've rolled this out a little bit and tell us what you found. In the meantime, where can people learn more about you? And you produce quite a lot of content on your own. So where can they find out more about you guys and learn about what you're up to at the Mirror Platform and really solid content management? Uh, well, in the uh, until we relaunch everything, uh, we'll, you can find our most of the stuff that I publish is on mxp.getmirror.com slash blog. That will all be moving over to our Blue River site, which is blueriver.com. And uh, every once in a while, I get stuff published out and about on different places, uh, I guess, on the internet. So we find stuff there as well. Um, and then, of course, Twitter at Sean underscore Schroeder. And that's Schroeder, S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R. Correct? I get that right? Not Schrader. But That's Schroeder. correct. That's correct. <laughs> Not straight. Well, Sean, That's thank right. you so much for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Park. I enjoyed it very much. And as you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fanboy, so it was my pleasure. Oh, great. Well, I appreciate that. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. If I can help you get your brand story straight, clarify your story to amplify your growth and simplify your life, then come on over and see me at businessofstory.com. Download your workbook. It's only 45 bucks. It's the best investment you're ever going to put in. It's 64 pages. 32 of those are for you and your brand story. The other 32 are examples of how to use this and how to apply it. And listen to Sean's show. If you're doing this yourself, listen along with this show and some of the others I've produced here on Business of Story. It'll take you by the hand through the workbook so that you got an idea of how you are going to unearth your story. And if I can be of assistance to you there, you can pick my brain and a couple of hour sessions here and there, or you can hire me for the full enchilada brand story development. Would love to help you clarify your story to amplify your impact. And thank you for listening to this edition. Until next Sunday, when we'll bring you another amazing, insightful content manager, story artist, dude like Sean. I want you to have a wonderful life. And remember the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.